and uh, as a big surprise, uh, Tim Trotsky, who's a culture phenomenon in his own in his own right, um, I will begin to tell you what a TV looks like. Uh, if you try to put an American TV together, which I gather you haven't, uh, they would be quite long and very very diverse, uh, with very very many compartments. Suffice it to say that he's one of the um, he's one of he's, he's somebody who comments regularly. Uh, as he was telling me himself, not so much about Russian um, uh, politics directly understood with a capital P, but about, uh, let's say, the, um, the context that makes politics possible, um, that it allows for certain things. Um, I myself am Yanni Kosonis, I'm a historian of Russia. Um, I, I wanted to tell you that one of the reasons why all of us have been talking and why we thought this was a good idea to do is because this is a Ukrainian issue that we've been dealing with. The Crimea is, technically speaking, a Ukrainian issue. Um, it involves Russia, which is a geopolitical question, but there's also the question of what's been happening in Russia, and what's been making Russian actions and attitudes possible recently. Uh, for me personally, it's been a sad moment, because I've been seeing uh, a certain kind of rhetoric and a certain dumbing down of the conversation across the board. Um, I, I, I'm actually uh, find myself in a time warp, as if I'm in 1985, having nonsensical conversations with uh, people on one or another side of the political divide, and I find this to be sad and intellectually a pity. Um, on the other hand, it's still our job to try to understand, um, to try to at least contextualize what's going on. What better way to do this uh, than to turn to the one person who is in close touch with all of this, and who's been thinking and talking about this so much, and that would be Tim himself. I asked him, as a surprise, if he would please go first, uh, to set us off in a conversation about um, Russia, Russia vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, uh, and also what is making this Russia possible. Is this a fair request to have given? I'll try my best. <laughs> Hello. Uh, well, uh, I will try to be as reserved <laughs> as possible, although in reality I feel very emotional and, practically speaking, uh, quite depressed with what's going on in Russia and in the Ukraine, and between Russia and Ukraine, and between those two countries on one side and the Western world on the other side. I mean, everything that's happening uh, is bad news. Uh, except for one good news. I think, uh, I think that in the Ukraine, sooner or later, rather later than sooner, but there will be a happy end in the Ukraine. I'm sure that they will, they will overcome and they will manage to become uh, a happy and civilized European country. I mean, the tunnel is long, but I, I do believe that there is a light at the end of this tunnel, and I'm very happy uh, for, for the Ukrainians who indeed have uh, deserved a better life because, you know, they've made a very uh, strong and passionate sacrifice you know what has happened in, uh, in Maidan in the course of the past several months, and and they've shown, I think, uh, real m miracles of of strength and bravery, for which I, you know, I have my deepest respect for the Ukrainians, and uh, and I think, well, I think that at the end of the day, it will pay back fully. Uh, I was at Maidan. I was there uh, in mid-December last year, so this was before the violence, but already after the first uh, crackdown of November 30th. And I was one of uh, the very few uh, Russian citizens who have been given the privilege uh, to talk there. I made a short speech. And uh, you know, being a well-known expert in uh, popular music, I also played a DJ set there. <laughs> and and it was Sunday, I think between five and six o'clock p.m. So this was prime prime time, and the, well, they they said that there had been a half million people. By my estimation, it was a little less, maybe two or three hundred thousand people. But you know, still it was. For me, it was an experience of a lifetime. And I can tell you that uh, uh, I, was, I was tremendously impressed 
with what I saw at Maidan. It was, uh, you know, it was very much unlike what we are used to see in Russia. You know, we also had huge rallies, you know, in, 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 in Balotna Ploshit, uh, at uh, Ulitsa Sakharov and so on, also tens of thousands, maybe about 100,000 people, with great atmosphere, funny, funny billboards, uh, uh, interesting speeches, creative costumes, and so on. So, so it did feel like a carnival, but it was really a carnival after which all people simply went home, period. So it was, yeah, okay, let's have, uh, let's have some fun political style, uh, but uh, tomorrow we have to go to work, or, uh, or tomorrow we have other things to do. So uh, protesting Russians, they never stayed there. You know, they all uh, had something more important on their agenda, probably. Uh, whereas the Ukrainians, as you know, they really occupied Maidan, and they made a fortress out of Maidan. And uh, inside this fortress, the atmosphere was absolutely tremendous. Well, I don't really know what what was the coverage of the Ukrainian uh, protest scene in uh, the American media. Of course, I know how it was portrayed in the Russian media, and it was like 99% certified lies. Uh, but, uh, well, I can give you a first-hand witness of all this, and I can tell you that uh, there was absolutely no violent moves at the Maidan. People were very determined, uh, but very kind of nicely spirited. There wasn't a single drunk person at Maidan, although there were hundreds of thousands, no drug, uh, no drugs, no drinks, no nothing. Very, very strictly. Uh, I, I've been told that if uh, if the guards of uh, Maidan s spotted someone uh, who was drunk, you know, to be solely <laughs> teasing people and so on, you know, they just uh, removed him from the site and told him uh, to go home and, uh, and go to sleep. Uh, really weird pictures, like, you know, that Maidan is in the very center of Kiev, and this also is the poshest area of Kiev. So they have all those expensive uh, restaurants and boutiques there. So, you know, it looked like, you know, there's a Gucci or Burberry boutique, and uh, two meters from it, you know, there are tires and, and barricades and pieces of concrete and so on. I mean, it really looked like uh, like some weird uh, uh, anti-utopian uh, feature movie, like Escape from L.A. or Escape <laughs> from Kiev. And during all this Maidan stand, there hasn't been a single case of vandalism. I mean, all the all these boutiques and fancy restaurants, they all kept working, and and they also helped uh, 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 the population of uh, of Maidan. I mean, at the restaurants, you know, people could use their toilets. I'm not sure about about whether they gave them foie gras, uh, but uh, but they definitely helped them. Another important thing, uh, which is uh, which I also was quite surprised and impressed with, is that uh, you know the uh, Russian propaganda theory is that Maidan is only a bunch of Nazis, a bunch of people from Western Ukraine who do not represent uh, the population. Now, this is absolutely untrue. I think 95, maybe 99% of people living in Kiev, they were supporting Maidan. I 
mean, a lot of people of all kinds, you know, from babushkas to hipsters, you know, they came to Maidan uh, uh, as if it was their uh, nighttime job. At 6 o'clock, they left their offices, their shops, their uh, whatever, plants, and, and went to Maidan. You know, when uh, really bad things started to happen, then there were thousands of, of volunteers uh, who, uh, who took wounded people in their private cars to hospitals. Again, thousands of, of, of people who supplied Maidan with food, uh, medicines, and so on. I mean, the whole city of Kiev was one, one big Maidan, although, of course, it, it was only this fortress in the center, you know, which, which was the center of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, this whole movement. Uh, there often is a talk, again, uh, mostly in Russia, about neo-Nazis, ultra-nationalists, and so on. Uh, I wouldn't say that this is uh, all lies. Of course, you know, there are uh, ultras in every crowd. I mean, you also have them uh, in America, we, we have plenty of them in Russia, and so on, yes. Uh, there were some, you know, like we call them, Maroski, I don't know the English, <laughs> the English word. Well, freaks, let's call them freaks. Uh, who were uh, uh, kind of wearing uh, swastikas or whatever. I personally, uh, I've spent two days at, at Maidan. I haven't seen a single person like that. I mean, they are tiny, tiny, absolutely minimal minority. But of course, in the Russian media, uh, you know, I think that they've, they've even, uh, you know, probably staged that, you know, they had, you know, those people with, uh, with uh, uh, portraits and, uh, and swastikas and things like that. But, but this, is not, uh, this is not the case uh, with the Ukrainian uh, protest movement. It's, it's just a very exotic and indeed very un unpleasant uh, minority. Uh, also, uh, when I was there, I'm not sure about now because since then, uh, unfortunately, a lot of things have changed. Some for the better, but some for the worse. But at that time, there were absolutely no anti-Russian uh, sentiments at Maidan. Actually, most of uh, of my uh, friends in Kiev, I mean, you know, people from the musical community or journalistic community, and so on. They are not Ukrainians. You know, this is, well, I don't know why. Well, I know uh, most of uh, uh, the best Ukrainian musicians, uh, including the guy from Google, Bordella, uh, and they are ethnic Ukrainian, but like most journalists who I know are, are Russians or, or, or Georgians or Jews, but, uh, but not Ukrainians. Now, all, all those non-Ukrainians were there at, at at Maidan. As you probably know, the first guy who got killed was an Armenian, second guy who got killed was Belarusian. Out of 70 plus people who were killed at Maidan by snipers, 20 were ethnic Russians. Uh, and all my, all my Russian friends, they, they, uh, they've been there. Well, I think that uh, maybe now the mood is somewhat different and, and for obvious reasons. Uh, but at, at that time, there was absolutely, absolutely no talks about hate uh, Russians. And, uh, so what, what did they think of? I mean, so what, what, how would you describe the, um, what they're protesting that? Because the way it's presented in the media here was part of the anti-Russian protest. And you're telling us it wasn't. So what, uh, what do you think brought them all together? Okay, I would say that uh, the first uh, the first impulse was, of course, uh, it came from the fact that Yanukovych has cheated the Ukrainians concerning uh, the European Union treaty. So the 
this was how it started. But then the European agenda was uh, overshadowed by, uh, by anti Yanukovych uh, protest. I mean, you know, what they really wanted to do is, is, to, is to get rid of, of, of these uh, uh, insanely corrupted and cynical uh, uh, regime of uh, Yanukovych. And uh, and I think that uh, here in this sentiment, all the Ukrainians, including even the Ukrainians in uh, in the southeast of the country and even Crimea, have been uh, together. I mean, they they all they all hate them uh, for uh, for very clear uh, reasons. So. Uh, so this is how uh, this is how all all this proceeded, and uh, well, what happened later, you know, became you know it became big, uh, big and tragic news. Uh, yes, and also it's very important, probably the most important thing about Maidan. Uh, Maidan has no leaders. You know, the, this uh, stereotype is that there's a big crowd at Maidan and the three or four leaders, Mr. Klitschko, Mr. Uh, Yatsenyuk, Mr. Zeknipok, and Yulia Tymoshenko, uh, or a ghost of Yulia Tymoshenko in, you know, in cowards. Uh, in reality, and that's the most amazing thing, this was not so. The leader was Maidan itself, and all those guys who were kind of presented as, as leaders, they were just given uh, mandates by a Maidan to do this and that, to sign this and that, and, and, and to behave uh, you know, in a certain way. And this is why when I heard at, about uh, this uh, protocol of February 21st, signed by Yanukovych on, on, on one side, a couple of European uh, bureaucrats on the other side, and a couple of, uh, you know, Lichko, Yatsinyuk on the side of the opposition, I wrote in, in my blog uh, immediately that this is a piece of paper which is worth nothing. Because if Maidan, you know, if those hundreds of thousands of people at Maidan will not accept it, it will never work. And this is exactly what happened. And, 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 and there was a <coughs> tremendously profound moment. I mean, you know, something, you know, uh, you know a lot of things there, they, like they come from movies. You know, it's uh, it's very it's so dramatic. You know, such things they they rarely happen in real life. So uh, when there was this uh, this talk about this treaty about presidential elections in December, blah blah, then of course the the crowd at, at Maidan they booed Pichko and Yatsenyuk, and then a guy, a very simple guy, you know, one of the guards of Maidan, Sotnik. Uh, well, I don't know the word in English. Uh, well, a small-time commander of of, uh, of of the guardsmen of Maidan. He simply came on stage and said, "No way! If this is going to happen, we are going to storm the uh, the president's palace." And that was it. And and it was clear that this is exactly what's what's going to happen. I mean. Uh, this was this was like a dream of uh, of uh, I don't know who of, of all the people of John Lennon power to the people it was power to the people uh, in its purest and most effective form and, and and again this this was something that you know I envy Ukrainians so much I mean I simply can't imagine such things happening in 
in Russia because in Russia people don't really uh, want power. They they want some someone else to take care of them, and they they really don't want to take uh, to take power in their hands. So uh, what happened next, you know? And now I'll just uh, say a few words about the consequences. As I told you, I think I think that everything will be eventually fine in the Ukraine. I think that the consequences of this crisis for Russia will be far, far more catastrophic. Uh, and, and and here I really don't see any any positive outcome. Uh, if we to, uh, if we talk about about sh uh, short term consequences, then one is that. Uh, Russia and Ukraine for several generations to come will never be friendly nations. You know, it will be, you know, Ukraine is so deeply offended by what Russia has done in different directions. It's, it's the support of Yanukovych, it's, uh, it's uh, the cutting off of, uh, of, of Crimea, it's the things that uh, it's the economic pressure and so on. I think I think that uh, that there will be no 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 friendship between Russia and, and Ukraine for many many years uh, to come. And and I personally think that it's worse for Russia than for the Ukraine because Europe. Uh, it, Ukraine rather soon will be accepted in the European Union, and they will have, you know, plenty of, of friends and partners in the West, uh, in the South, and so on. Russia stands absolutely alone, and this is the, the second catastrophic uh, consequence. Russia, as huge as it, it is has no friends in the world. It's absolutely alone. It's like you know, Lone Ranger or you know, whatever character in a, in a world mythology. I mean, it's one against everyone else, and it's a handmade position. I mean, it, it has been carefully maintained by uh, by uh, by Vladimir Putin. I have no idea. What was the purpose? So, as, as far as I understand, even Russia's closest allies, uh, namely Kazakhstan and Belarus, they don't support what Russia is doing. Of course, they, they also feel very vulnerable towards Russia because northern parts of Kazakhstan, you know, they also can be easily claimed as Iskonne Ruskie Ziemli. Uh, like uh, no Russian land, which, by the way, is something that uh, Solzhenitsyn has called for. Said that you know we have to take Patryushia uh, away from Kazakhstan and uh, the eastern part of Belarus. You know cities like uh, Orsha and, and Vitebsk. Uh, you know they also they also maybe. Maybe uh, easily described as uh, ancient Russian cities. So uh, Lukashenko, n no matter how how dodgy he himself is, uh, he uh, he today has expressed his uh, his support uh, for the Ukraine, and he said that that no one in Kremlin can uh, dictate in Belarus how how to build relations. With Ukraine and, and and we in Belarus will uh, will uh, do what is in our national interest. So so there's no friends. I don't know. Maybe Venezuela. Maybe North Korea. I mean, uh, it's uh, even China, as you know, keeps uh, keeps very very quiet and unsupportive of Russia in this whole case. 
so international isolation, of course, of course, it's uh, well, it's no fun. It's no fun, fun, and I personally, you know, I, I, I'm not very happy about being a citizen of a, of a rock state, of a pariah state. And, and this, I'm afraid, is exactly what will happen uh, to Russia in uh, some years to come. I mean, so you're, when it comes to the explanation for what's happening domestically in Russia, which is part of what we're concerned with, um, your explanation lies mainly in the cultural level, which is the passivity uh, of the Russian population, um, a, a desire for authority and to be ruled rather than rule themselves. So bracketing that for just a moment, so we move on to some of the other responses. No, I actually think that it would be better to have a response from people who work on contemporary issues. Josh? Sure. Um, I prepared some slides, but in uh, sympathy with the telecommunications being shut off in Crimea, we decided not to have our talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, but I'm happy to share with anyone who wants. All right, I, I want to talk about four things uh, very quickly. Um, the first is the puzzle. What's puzzling about this? The second thing I want to talk about is what's motivating Putin. After I talk about a number of potential explanations for what I think is motivating Putin, I'm going to sort of focus it on what I think is one big picture question uh, for understanding this. And the final thing is I want to close with, uh, with something that's not getting an awful lot of discussion here, although it is in corners for blogosphere, which is to raise the question of what this all means for nuclear non-proliferation going forward in the future. All right, so um, the puzzle is uh, that a priori, uh, there were a lot of people who didn't think this was going to happen. Uh, those of you who read my blog know I was one of them. Uh, because there were an awful Same lot here. of reasons, there are an awful lot of reasons, and a lot of them have been said already here, why Russia has a lot to lose from removing Crimea from Ukraine and annexing it, not to, not to mention to try to do the same thing in eastern Ukraine. Uh, one, of the, one of my favorite, head, favorite headlines I've seen in recent days on, uh, on people writing an opinion piece about this, and I've read an awful lot of them, is uh, one with one was headline something along the effect of why Ukraine should give Crimea to Russia and why Russia should not accept it. Right? <laughs> you know, there are an awful lot of reasons to think this is a bad idea for Russia. Right? We start with the point that was already made here, which is the future of Ukrainian politics. Right? In one fell swoop, Russia is taking out the most pro-Russian part of Ukraine and alienating the rest of it. Maybe not alienating everyone in Donetsk, but alienating an awful lot of the remaining people. You have had razor's edge elections in Ukraine since independence between forces that wanted to be more oriented towards the east and more oriented towards the west. You take out Crimea, the east doesn't win it. You take out Crimea and simultaneously piss off lots of Russian speakers who might have seen themselves as ethnic in Ukrainian but been sympathetic to closer relations with Russia. You make it really hard. So I am very much sharing, in fact, it was so taken by this position before it started that I thought this is why you wouldn't do this. This is not Georgia, right? This is a totally different situation. And you're going to affect, and I, I like your, I'm going to quote your thing for things, but I think you're right that for generations, Ukrainian politics is going to proceed differently. But that's only the tip of the iceberg here, right? So you've taken what historically thousands of years, you know, a thousand year relationship here and poisoned it for an awful lot of people. But also on a very pragmatic level, it would be like taking Texas out of the United States and if you have a Tea Party, right? You're not going to win presidential elections if you strip out Texas, even if you could get the independent Tea Party of Texas. That would be it for winning the US presidency. Just a similar thing. The second thing is this question of international isolation. Right? And international isolation, and there's, some, there's a very nice piece, uh, you're seeing a lot more of this in the last couple of days, but international isolation in a globalized world does not mean the same thing as international isolation used to mean 20 years ago. There are real consequences from international isolation. Now maybe this is part of a, of a and we'll talk about what Putin's thinking in a minute, and maybe this is part of a play to domestic politics that we don't need anybody, but there are real consequences to being internationally isolated for all sorts of goals you might want to uh, project. There are also going to be serious economic consequences of this, right? Uh, I saw an estimate from Sergei Goryev saying that just propping up Crimea, not to mention all the side payments that are now trying to be made to the Crimean Tatars, everyone who's going to have to be paid off here, but just propping up Crimea, propping up Crimea is going to cost uh, half a percent of Russian GDP going forward. Because remember, Ukrainian GDP per capita is one third uh, of Russian GDP per capita, and Crimean GDP per capita, despite the military complex, despite a tourism industry, which, I mean, it's, okay, we'll see what a tourism industry is this summer, right? <laughs> is two-thirds of Ukrainian average GDP. 
This is a poor region, right? Uh, so there are going to be economic consequences just to prop up Crimea. And, and, right, and the last thing anybody's going to want to see is Crimea failing economically once the Russians take ownership of it. But there are more economic consequences, right? This Russian stock market is tanking again. Right? It's fallen again. Right? There was the big fall, and then, oh, it jumped back up, and there was a little big story about how the Russian state had bought up all these shares of stock, and it was very was a very good move for Russia because they got it in cheaper. Well, you know what? After that little feel-good story, the Russian stock market's back down again below where it was when it fell the first time, and it's falling today. Right? So you're talking about wiping off 15% of the value of the MySex already. Right? So who knows if that's going to end? Stock markets are fickle. Right? There are potential sanctions. There are protect, potential economic consequences, and we'll see how far these go. But there are potential economic consequences to the people who surround Putin, what my colleague uh, Bruce Wanda de Mosquito would call the selectorate. Right? There are people who are going to have visa privileges suspended. There are assets that are going to be frozen. So we can talk about economic consequences writ large for the whole country, or we can talk about economic consequences for particular elite actors. Markets, trade, right? If what really comes out of this is that the United States changes its laws about the export of liquefied natural gas in the post-fracking era, that is going to long-term hurt Russia's influence over what happens in Western Europe more than anything that's going on today. Right? If Russian natural, natural, ga natural gas is no longer needed to supply Western Europe because the Americans can frack everything and stick it in boats and ship it over there, which, by the way, is currently not allowed under US law, right? that's going to have long-term consequences, right? So there are all these economic consequences. Then there's the military consequences, right? Again, you look at the size of the Ukrainian army, it's much bigger than the Georgian army. Now, we don't seem, thankfully, at this point, uh, to be engaging to see on the horizon a full-scale war between the Ukrainian and Russian armies. Doesn't mean it's not going to happen, right? Doesn't seem to be happening. But that would have huge consequences, right? That would be costly in terms of Military would be costly in terms of what it reveals about Russian military preparedness. It would be costly in terms of the cost of, of the actually fighting the war. Um, and of course, there would be economic repercussions into having to bolster up the army and bolster up security forces at that point. The other sort of potential military conflict that comes out of Crimea is what happens with the Crimean Tatars. In the sort of circles that I run in with other political scientists, this has been a huge point of discussion in the last couple of days. And there's been huge efforts going on to sort of buy off the Tatars and get the Tatars, you know, firmly ensconced in whatever post-Ukraine Crimea there is. But at the very least, it's going to be expensive. And at the very worst, it may not work, right? And so Russia already has radicalized Muslim minorities in that part of the world, right? Here's the situation. If this doesn't pan out exactly according to plan, Right? You have a rested minority that's a Muslim population that's near other Muslim populations that have been radicalized. And oh yeah, do you think there's anyone in the neighborhood who might be willing to supply them with weapons? I don't know. Maybe. Right? So this is another headache. There's consequences for relations with other neighbors. Right? China is not hot to trot to embrace the principle of where you have a large ethnic minority, those people can split off from the country. Right? The Kazakhs, the, I mean, as you put it, they're clo you're clo when your closest allies in the world are Kazakhstan and Belarus, and you manage to piss them off simultaneously, right? that's another problem, too. So there are, and then finally, there is the question that we do not know the answer to. Right? We know that there's a rally around the flag effect going on in the way that people are answering survey questions right now in Russia. Putin looks to have increased his popularity, which is something we see very often when there are threats to national threats to national security, when there's foreign adventures of going on, it's called the rally around the flag. We don't know what the long-term consequences of what Russians will think about their sons in the army going off and getting in a fighting war with Ukrainians. Right? Again, given this thousand-year shared history, maybe if there were other people standing up here, they would tell you it would be very popular because it's so important to keep Ukraine away from the West and the, the Poland. It may not. It may, however, turn out to be very unpopular. Right to be uh, to be involved in a shooting war with Ukrainians, right? The children of, of Afghan vets who all fought together, right now their kids are going to be shooting each other in this war, and so we don't know. So all these are reasons why um, why a lot of us, there, an awful lot of people, didn't see this coming, and an awful lot of people were surprised that this happened because there are all these compelling reasons to expect this not to happen. And yet, we now see Crimea sort of marching forward towards Crimea. They've announced today they're going to declare independence. Marching, the Russian Federation has already announced the name of the new republic. It's going to be called the Crimean Republic. 
which is a little bizarre because it won't be an autonomous republic, which is going to may set off a cascade of things among there may be other Russian oblasts who now want to be republics because it turns out you don't actually need a titular minority to be a republic. Why does Crimea get special status? There's a whole other cascade that we come out of this. But let's say this is going forward. So why? Why is why a priori if there were so many good reasons for this not to happen, uh, why would it happen? And as I said, you know, I think being in the prediction game with Putin right now is a bad game to be in. <laughs> so I'm not going to try to predict, but what I would like to do with the remainder of my remarks is just frame what I think are five possible explanations, right? And the thing, the reason I think it's important to start coming to terms with these different types of explanations is they have different implications, both for how the end game is likely to play out and what the appropriate sort of policy responses may be for people from other actors. Um, and so hopefully you can see where you fit in these sort of general categories. And maybe in our discussion, people can raise other categories of explanations. So the first explanation of why, you know, why so many of us didn't see this coming is to say, well, the interests of Russians in Crimea and eastern Ukraine is what's driving Putin. And that this actually trumps all these kind of material concerns or these other longer term strategic concerns that I've, uh, I've, I've laid out here. So, but I deliberately kept that sentence vague, right? Because that could mean, actually, it's that Putin's interested in the fate of Russians in Ukraine and Crimea. Or it could mean that Russians in Russia are interested in the fate of Russians in Ukraine and Crimea. Right? So it, I'm not ascribing here any sort of moral high ground one way or another. I'm saying we could take this, we could take Putin at his word and say this is what he's concerned about. He's concerned about the fate of people here. We could put a highly normative spin on this, that he's really concerned about them because Putin really cares about the fate of anyone anywhere who's under you know, threat and duress. Or we could put a much more naked politics spin on this, that he thinks it would be a disaster for him politically if things happened to Russians in Ukraine and Crimea and he didn't do anything to step in, that that could be undermining his popularity. And before this, we're in a period of time where the Russian economy has sort of puttered out and stalled out, and we have a period of a demographic crisis in Russia, and we have Putin's popularity not being where it was. So maybe for either political reasons or whatever reasons, we take him at his word. That's one explanation. So that'd be one reason we missed that, that like all these other things are dwarfed by the fact. Now, it could also be that Russians are interested in Crimea because of longstanding history. Right. It could be, there's a piece I'm going to put up on the monkey cage in the next day or so about from a historian who's writing about religion and the role of Crimea in Orthodox religion. Right. So there's lots of reasons that this could be the case and that there could be these kind of, uh, these kind of, uh, you know, we could call this sort of writ large concerns about culture, concerns about nationalism. And this sort of thing. So that's one reason. Maybe we got it wrong that these kinds of sentiments trump, uh, trump the sort of other interests we're talking about. A second thing that we could have gotten it wrong is that this could really be about the fear of losing the Black Sea Fool. Right? And that with everything else going on, all these other things are sort of dwarfed by the threat that somehow the current, as when Yanukovych left, this was somehow going to end up in the Russians losing control of the fleet, losing access to warm water ports. Although, to me personally, I mean, this was a thing that was raised to me a lot that, that I had missed originally of saying that underestimating. As an American, I watched this have a fleet in Guantanamo, a base in Guantanamo, with Cuba being our sort of mortal enemy for 50 years. Like, I don't expect the Cubans to overrun Guantanamo Bay anytime soon. You know, I, warm water ports, okay, I'm, I'm going to try not to be, I mean, the Russians just have to wait like 20 years, they'll have all the warm water ports they need. So, I mean, there's, um, uh, <laughs> but, so that, maybe that's it. Maybe the Black Sea Fleet, maybe they looked at the situation in, 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 in Kiev, maybe they saw the people who were involved, and they said, we have to do whatever we can to secure the Black Sea Fleet. So that's the second explanation, which, by the way, has very different implications from the first explanation. The third one is the one that's getting an awful lot of play in the Western media and in the press, which is that this is a story of greater Russia. That Putin... We take the man in his word. He says the greatest tragedy of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. This was a century with a lot of tragedies, so that's a big statement, right? And that he sees his place in history is to restore Russia to its formal imperial greatness. That he has a plan, which basically means when opportunity presents itself, you take advantage of that opportunity. And he wants to grow Russia back up. If this is the story, right, and then that, and so then there are all these long-term strategic consequences that that are calculations that are more important than the strategic calculations I mentioned earlier, because this is about a greater Russia dream. If this is the story, then Kazakhstan, 
Estonia, there's a lot of implications for what happens if this is actually the story, um, and this is what's motivating everything. A fourth possible explanation is that this is less about Crimea, and it's more about what happened on the Maidan. That this is about a threat to the Russian political model. That there is a Western model of kind of liberal democracy, and there's a Russian model of what's called managed democracy or sovereign democracy. And that much like in the Cold War, where it was important that Russia be surrounded by similar types of regimes, that there is a desire that they make sure there be similar types of regimes around Russia. And that the Russian political model was clearly the sort of model for Yanukovych. And that to wake up and suddenly see that rejected so forcefully, that was a threat to the style of rule in Russia. Right? And so that is what had to be responded to. That what's really driving this is that the Maidan has to be made into a failure. So that's a different set of implications that we're trying. The final set of implications that I've seen much less discussion about, and I'm not the right person to tell you whether, well, I'm not taking aside any of these, right? But uh, I'm not the right person to tell you whether it's right or wrong. But it's possible that we got the economic implications of the puzzle backwards. People have been focused on this being costly to people around Putin. Around Putin. It's possible that if Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine, is the end game here, that there is actually an opportunity for business interests in Russia who are starting to run out of things in Russia that they could get their hands into Eastern Ukrainian <coughs> industry. Um, and that this is actually, again, it's hard to envision how this story is what motivates everything, but it's seen as an opportunity to expand business opportunities for people who are uh, among this selectorate. So there are five different explanations. I think the things that I started with, all the reasons he shouldn't have done this were compelling, and yet he did. So there's got to be some explanation for what's going on. And I think the importance of trying to think through these systematically is that they have implications for what we may be seeing next. Um, I think, but if you take them all together, if you want to sort of boil this down even more, one fundamental question that I think is motivating the debate that's going on between experts, between analysts, between journalists, between everyone who's sort of telling about the story, is, is Putin acting, is the underlying story here that Putin is acting from a, a position of strength or a position of weakness? Right? If you read the Western media, right, the mainstream Western media, you get the picture, I think, that Putin is coming at this from a position of strength, which is very convenient from a narrative that lots of people want to question the United States that Obama is weak, right? And that, but that this is entirely a story about the U.S. not bombing Syria. If only Obama hadn't said there was a red line and then not crossed it, this is Putin, the strong Putin, carrying out all his goals because the West is weak and we need Ronald Reagan back, you know, and so. Even though that, that I can go to that. But anyway, that's one story. That Putin is acting from a, of a strength. He's called the West bluff. There's no way the West is going to put troops on the ground in Ukraine. Is the West really going to put troops on the ground in Estonia? If he goes into Estonia, is NATO dead? Is the entire sort of post-World War II order in Europe dead? I mean, and you see pieces like this, right? So that's one story. This is a man who is cagey who came out of the Olympics riding high, he took one look at the international scenario, and he had the strength, and he's acted out of strength, moved his troops in, and no one can stop him. Um, and then certain other narratives, which we don't have to get into right now, follow uh, from that one. The alternative is that Putin's acting from a position of weakness. And I think that's the position that was addressed uh, by our first speaker here today. And that this is a story about Putin coming out of the Olympics, in the middle of the Olympics, the thing he had been planning for forever, that was his crowning glory, right? That he had even done all these, I mean, there's some weird things about Putin not caring about his international image, because he does the pussy riot thing, he lets Navalny out, he does the Trumpet Korakovsky, there are a lot of things going on, he comes riding out of the Olympics, and while he's at the Olympics, right, Russia's closest ally seems to fall in a direct repudiation of Russian style of rule, Russian thing, but this really, it was set up, you know, he came in riding in, they were cagey, they did a, they did a they end around around the EU, they got this EU agreement, and then the next thing you know, the regime's gone. And there was panic. And there was a sense that something had to be done, and there's been a continual sense of something having to be done, but that there's no rhyme or reason to it. Right? Was, was there panic over worrying about repercussions for his popularity at home in, in Russia? Was there panic about long-term economic outlook if, Russia, if Ukraine became out of Russia's sphere of interest? 
Um, I, Goryev, Sergey Goryev had a piece today where he wrote, since the crisis began, Russia's leaders have repeatedly contradicted their previous statements, backtracked, reversed decision, and denied easily verifiable facts. All of this indicates that Russian political leaders have no strategy and do not foresee the consequences of their decision. Even the Kremlin's own supporters acknowledge that Putin's improvising. Right, so this is the kind of this that, is being that was, that was Goryev. Yeah. Now Goryev, right, has his own. You know, Goryev has reasons not to like the Putin administration. Um, but again, I'm just sort of saying there are these two positions out there. Right. That's a sort of classic statement of this is being done for me. And I think the answer. If you're looking for a first question to try to figure out where you fall on all these explanations, the answer of whether you think Putin is acting from a position of strength or weakness uh, is one that I think it's, that's illustrative. The final thing I just want to say is that one thing that's getting lost in all this is this question of the 19, I mean, it is sort of getting lost, but the 1994 Budapest Memorandum, right? Ukraine traded away its nuclear weapons for a guarantee of territorial sovereignty from the Russian Federation, Britain, and the United States. You can go find, I mean, I, I was going to be on the slide. I've got the text of the Budapest Memorandum. That's the deal, right? Now, Putin is saying it's not a legitimate government. People are going to talk about self-determination of Crimea. You know, why shouldn't Crimea have the same self-determination rights in Kosovo? Nevertheless, this was the last time we got a country with, new, everyone got a country with a lot of nuclear weapons to give up those nuclear weapons, right? Is that ever going to happen again? What do you take out of this if you're Iran? Right, what, or, we know what Rouhini, I think we know what Rouhini, but what do you take out of this if you're a hardline cleric in Iran who's been inclined to give Rouhini the benefit of the doubt over these negotiations? Or maybe you're not, maybe Iran's made a decision for whatever reasons that are idiosyncratic to Iran to go forward with this, but what do you take out of this if you're Pakistan? I mean, it seems like there's a major credibility issue at stake. And as been pointed out, um, most of these countries that are in this position of people wanting to disarm are geographically proximate to Russia, right? So there's a, there's a big issue in here. And I don't have the answer to this, but I worry. This is something that I worry about that will be long term beyond this, that if everybody settles into a post, you know, Crimea status quo in some different way, this issue is still going to be hanging out there. It's going to be a long-term consequence beyond this. Clear. Um, wonderful. Okay, did you want to step in? Sure. Um, so, Tom, that's the follow. I mean, as I spent years in graduate school studying avant-garde poetry, and then moved on to write about Russian biography. So clearly, you want to hear what I have to say. Um, but there are a couple things I can say. There is actually a pornographic connection. That's an aside that in. Um, one of the first Russian men's magazines, not the one that I was doing, ended up um, editing later, but on the um, there was a photo spread of a woman dressed in military garb, um, not dressed very much, she had a little hat and job bags and nothing else, um, and it was all about uh, the Black Sea and, and, the, and Crimea, and there was poetry accompanying it, because of course you have to have poetry in a pornographic magazine, um, and the poetry was saying, um, and Crimea is, the fleet is ours, and Crimea will be ours. This is 1995. So this keeps coming back to me, um, not in a particularly erotic way, but in an erotic way um, uh, since then. But really what I wanted to talk about was more um, this in terms of narratives. Like I can't really address um, exactly what is happening, um, but what I can address is how people are talking about it, and that's what I find really fascinating. Um, because uh, Yanni talked about the sense of a time warp here, a Cold War time warp, and certainly our, our colleague Steve Cohen talks about that um, quite, mostly quite effectively. Um, but um, what I see is just a number of moments in time that seem to be the frozen we keep return, returning to in ways to understand this. And it's disturbing because this makes me think of another more recent moment of time where similar narrative strategies were employed, and that was in the dissolution of Yugoslavia, which is, of course, the um, the model that no one um, in the former Soviet Union looks looks to with with um, with happiness. Um, when Yugoslavia was falling apart, if you want to put it that way, um, obviously the conflict between um, Croats and Serbs, but the way it was talked about by people on each side, the Croats weren't fighting Serbs, the Croats were fighting Chetniks, which were the partisans um, in World War II. The Serbs weren't fighting Croats, they were fighting the Ustasha, which was the um, Nazi collaborators in World War II. So that the, the battle that's happening now is being deliberately framed in terms of some terrible moment in the past. 
there are a couple bad repercussions of this. One is um, it's distracting. Um, and two, it, um, it reinforces that this really terrible interpretive model that came out of the Yugoslav War of Succession in the United States at the time, which was uh, his name Robert Kaplan or Robert D. Kaplan, his book Balkan Ghosts, which went on and on about how we could only understand Yugoslavia in terms of ancient hatreds. It's a terrible book. Terrible, terrible book, yes. Terrible. Um, one of the worst things ever written, and there's so much competition. Um, but it was um, not just terrible, it was pernicious because it took, in a sense, it took the propaganda of each side at face value, ignoring decades of people intermarrying um, and not necessarily divorcing, um, and um, these issues not being um, at the forefront, for, at the forefront, and turning them into some kind of inevitability. That is giving giving reality to the propaganda. Um, and so when we see the various reports in the Russian media and in the American media about what's happening in Maidan, what's happening in Crimea, um, the fact that we immediately, that the Russians immediately go to um, to neo-Nazis. Now neo-Nazis are, are an easy element to point to because they are, as we said, um, present pretty much everywhere, and certainly Russia um, can be proud of its own contingent. Um, but it's not just that they're, that this is the right wing element, but that this tarnishes Ukraine with a rush of collaboration. And so it's not just Nazis, it's, it's um, the Bandierovsky, that is the, the uh, collaborationist army, um, as to, to, make, to make the public feel that they're kind of refighting World War II. Um, and this is, um, this is quite pernicious. On the flip side, you have uh, the rhetoric in the Western media uh, only able to understand Putin and Russia in terms of the Soviet Union. And in fact, um, falling back to the, the same linguistic habit that existed when the Soviet Union existed, which was not distinguishing between the Soviet Union and Russia. So, um, so whatever Putin is doing, whatever Russia is doing, is always about the Soviet Union. So there's, it, there's a kind of sad narrative trap that's going on really all, on all sides um, that people don't seem to be particularly interested in getting out of. Um, and the one other thing I want to say that I was thinking about in terms of uh, the effects on Russia and why Russia's protests have not led to anything like Maidan, um, this also comes to a, a narrative um, question that really um, became quite clear during the collapse of the Soviet Union, which is that um, even though what was going on in Ukraine was largely about Ukraine, and um, also this narrative of choosing between West and East is so overdetermined and really problematic um, and, and neglects the fact that this is that if you look at it, okay, this might not be the best time to join the EU, um, setting aside everything else. Um, that um, where Russia, one disadvantage Russia had um, compared to the other republics in, in the wake of the Soviet collapse was they did not have a, um, they did not have another nation to blame. Um, they couldn't say this, you know, the, the Ukrainians could say this is all the Russians. Um, could then deliberately um, conflate the Soviet Union and, and Russia. Russia doesn't have that. Now, there are narratives in Russia that do blame everything going on in Russia on certain people, Jews, for instance, and so on and so forth. But these are not. The, these are narratives available to nationalists and hard right wingers who are not the, who are so far from the people protesting. So the people who are protesting for the, um, who are protesting in the past year or so, don't have that advantage of being able to put someone who's not. Um, Who's not Russia? Who's from the outside? Who is to blame? Um, and I think this is this is this complicates the situation greatly. Um, that's what I was going to say. Thank you. Yeah. So I work on 19th century Russian literature. Uh, why am I on this panel? Uh, for two reasons, really. First of all, I wrote a book about Nikolai Gogol, who was a Ukrainian-Russian writer and is today a battleground of identities. And depending on how you pronounce his name, you know, you're implicitly taking a side. But second, for the larger reason, is that I work on stories and narratives. And basically what we're hearing here is a series of narratives and people um, telling competing stories. I mean, certainly in the media, in the US media, we've had all kinds of competing stories. And um, by and large, they've been not very helpful. And I personally, in trying to figure out the situation, have found my own knowledge of Ukrainian and Russian history to be significantly less useful than the interventions of political scientists who attempt to explain to me, and other empiricists, who attempt to explain to me what's going on today. I think the historical narratives are so often tendentious that even, you know, as sympathetic as I am to historicism, I have not found them to be particularly useful. I have found 
accounting what's going on now to be much more useful. Another thing about narrative is that I am grateful to the people in Maidan, also to Yanukovych, also to Putin, also to the people in Crimea for restoring my belief in the prize. I was completely <laughs> shocked. I thought that we had you know, some version of a deterministic narrative here. And, um, you know, the, the, after, Putin, after Yanukovych fled, you know, all people did was look around and said, who knew? Who knew he was going to do that? And it was a, that was a happy surprise, right? A happy surprise. And then you move into what's been called the, the, gold, the golden toilet moment when, you know, they expose his, his they are scanning all his documents and putting it online, and there are many happy surprises there, right? And they expose his palace and, and all of his, his wealth. Then, I don't know how many hours later, there's another surprise, which is happening in Crimea. And um, really, I didn't think that I would ever be that surprised in my life. And there is something um, heartening, in a sense, about that, because I've been reading these competing historical narratives that are both really deterministic, teleological, and represent themselves as inevitable, right? Um, and then just to, to talk very briefly about about the long view, because again, you know, I do work on a writer who died in 1852. Um, he was born in Ukraine. He spoke Ukrainian. Um, he was interested in Ukrainian culture and, in effect, marketed himself as Ukrainian, right? Which you might be argued, you could be argued, was sort of like marketing himself as a Texan or something in the larger Russian imperial context at that point. But when he wanted to make a career, when Nikolai Vogel wanted to make it big, what did he do? He identified with the Imperial Center in Petersburg and he went there. And he conducted a literary career in Russian, in the Russian language, and in Russian literary institutions. This involved no renunciation of his Ukrainianness. You know, he remained Ukrainian and to a great degree, although to an arguable degree, Ukrainian identified. So, you know, my perspective as someone who works on a hybrid writer is that Ukraine is a hybrid place. And any future for this hybrid place, first of all, there's no inevitability in the story. And uh, I would only say that if it's going to be a good future, it's got to take that hybridity into account. Um, in, in ways that right now, when I hear Ukrainian and Russian intellectuals arguing over something as you know, relatively obscure as Nikolai Gogol, there is not a lot of nuance there at this point. I am instead hearing these sort of competing and mutually exclusive stories. So I'm very grateful to the speakers who are, for directing our attention in an empiricist way to what's happening right now. Wonderful. Um, all, uh, be brief myself, uh, and, and simply to pick up on what Anne was saying, because I think what Anne is saying is quite right, which is to say that we, because we're using very large historical frameworks and cultural frameworks, we tend to lose track of who's actually doing what and why they might be doing it on the micro level, and to begin on that level, actually. And from my point of view, I'm, I'm not a Ukrainian specialist, I'm a Russia specialist. And my question all the way through has been um, where everyone else has arrived as well, which is when did it all stop, stop making sense, or from the Russian point of view? Um, which is only quite recently from my point of view, which is to say as follows. That up until the point, I could follow what was going on in Russian policy. And it was I, I didn't agree with it, but I could explain it. I could, contextual, I could contextualize it. Until very recent times, the past couple of weeks. And the story, to me, was actually more simple than many of the of cultural, not, not these cultural critics, the ones in the, in the press in particular, where we're making up to be. It was simple like this, which is that, you know, yes, Russia believes that it's, it's a sphere of influence. I don't think it was about restoring the Soviet Union. I completely agree with that one. That's so overstated and so overstated uh, about restoring the Soviet Union. And I think Russia was interested in having um, an empire in the sense of economic empire. Uh, and what Russia really has lacked all along has been the economic might to go with it. Um, natural gas and oil will only take you so far. Uh, this gives you a tool, maybe. It gives you a, the possibility of short-term intervention, but it doesn't give you a sphere of influence in and of itself. And this is again Russia's problem. How do you exercise economic power rather than military power when you don't have the same economic might to go with it? To me, this has been a problem. And so when the European Union came and negotiated with Yanukovych and came up with a deal which, uh, despite, what everything, despite what we're saying at the end, and, and I think I slightly differ here, um, the European Union did not offer membership to, the, to Ukraine. It offered a paltry deal. Uh, it did not offer membership at the end of the road. It was offering to Ukraine what it had already offered Turkey over the past 30 years. 
which is not very good. You know, it also was slight in certain regards. But forced Ukraine, in order to accept this, um, to take sides in a geopolitical contest uh, between East and West. And not only an economic side, which is more integration for Europe, but also um, alignment with European uh, political and military policies, which forced the issue in ways that it had not been forced. They had to choose others between East and West, between, which is my reading of it. Um, and this was a pity, right? But it shouldn't, it just shouldn't necessarily determine what happened next. And what happened next was that Russia, which had put in too much of its, um, its bets on Yanukovych personally, um, lost again when Yanukovych lost his domestic support. But what happened was Yanukovych woke up and his guard was gone, literally. There was no one there to protect him anymore. Of course he's left. Right? It was a complete collapse of his authority, his personal authority. Um, and what happened next was, and th this is where, up until the point, it can still make sense. Now think about this historically. Why do we know about the Crimea? Why, why is it familiar to us in any sense? It's familiar to us in the Crimean War. Right? The Crimean War went as follows. Um, Russia and, sorry, uh, Britain and France in the year 1854 decided it was time to punish Russia, but not too much. So they attacked what was called at the time, it was the attack on the giant's toe, they called it, which was you, invent, you sent troops into the Crimea, forced Russia to react, showed Russia that the Britain and the French had the capacity to do this. Oh, and the Sardinians and the Ottomans too, but that was beside the point. They have the capacity to do this, and you cannot dislodge us. We're teaching you a lesson, in other words. And then we're going to leave. Sign the peace, capitulate, and then we're gone. Over. And then the rest of the problem is yours, and that became Russia's problem with the great reforms in the next in the next reign. So it was meant to be, it was a choice that was made because it was so localized, geographically and conceptually, it was so different and separate from the rest of the Russian Empire that you could make a very limited intervention and make a very specific point about your vulnerability. Now reverse this because Crimea is now Ukrainian. So Russia chooses the Crimea, sends its troops out from the bases, occupies the entire space. And so ask the Ukrainians to respond, which they can. Um, up until now, in a certain tactical sense, it still makes sense to me. Right? So it's not claiming the territory yet. It's not yet saying that you know we're here because we're challenging the borders that existed since 1991. What they're saying is we're going to teach you a lesson. You overthrew Yanukovych. You think you can act with impunity. You can. We can act with impunity. And here's our military presence to show that we can. So far, understandable to me. So far. Um, where it ceases to make sense to me is when it becomes an irredentist threat, which is to say because there's a Russian population, therefore this territory should belong to Russia, which is spoken in the Russian official circles. And this becomes a challenge on multiple levels. The only reason this area has been stable somewhat since 1991 is because everybody agreed to the 1991 borders. This would be the, this would be the departure. If we begin to fundamentally challenge the 1991 borders, the entire the entire picture could fall apart. Everything could fall apart. Who's going to challenge who next? There are 15 republics, each of them with borders with other republics. What happens when you challenge that? That's the part where, where, where Russian government policy ceased to make sense to me. If you challenge the 91 borders, then everyone is going to challenge everyone's borders, and we're all going to have the right to, because everyone has some population left on the other side of the borders. It's a catastrophe. It's a nightmare. But this is the part that I don't understand. We still don't know yet, however, where this is going to go. So, so far, even declaring the Crimean Republic is not yet saying it's therefore going to be a Russian Crimean Republic. We don't know yet where it's going to go. There will be a referendum. Now, if I were to think about Putin two years ago, I'd say, what he's probably going to do? And I'd be wrong because I'm predicting. Right? But what, I, what he's probably going to do is he's going to say, OK, we're going to hold a referendum. We're going to show that we can take you right to the, the point of annexation and rearranging the borders. We can take you right there, and then we're going to fall back magnanimously and say, no, it's part of Ukraine, and now we're going to negotiate a different agreement between ourselves. To show you, in other words, that we can do this if we want, but we won't. Because Russians do think historically, and they do think in terms of international law. Um, not always respectfully, but they do think in terms of international law. Which is to say, um, yes, we recognize these borders in 1991. These are important. Uh, it's still possible that this will happen. If it does not happen, this is where I'd actually begin to worry about the larger geopolitical question that you've been raising, um, um, which is to say, um, you know, so what's next? If you challenge the Crimean settlement, if you challenge your border with Ukraine, what comes next? And this is where I think we should all really worry, um, uh, uh, all of us, because I'm not sure who's calling the shots anymore. And I'm not sure on what basis they're calling the shots. The second question related to me, and this I'll say only briefly and put out there for the rest of you to, to comment on. Uh, which is that I, um, um, you know, it's been suggested in three different ways that I can think of. That there's actually an intersection between what was going on on Maidan 
on the one side. And what was going on in Moscow in 2012, when the demonstrations there, which is to say that don't look at them as purely um, a contest between Russians and Ukrainians. Look at them instead as a generalized protest against the post-1991 settlement domestically in each of these countries. Questions of corruption, and this is definitely a shared conversation, or should be, wouldn't you say? Um, and the original Maidan demonstrations could have been seen as a pretty understandable and shared objection uh, to the type of corrupt regimes that were put into place after 1991 and how they've evolved since 1991. Uh, and this is indeed, I think, where uh, there, there, there could be a, a similar conversation, similar fears expressed in Russia itself. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, this has been short circuited now because it's become us versus them, Ukrainians versus Russia. And this is a real pity. Um, but there is a larger conversation to be had about you know, the questions of the way resources are divided, incomes were divided in Russia as they were in Ukraine. There's a conversation to be had about the use of government uh, power in order to enrich oneself. And this is a straight question of corruption, which is, I think, how a lot of it started by now. It wasn't simply Yanukovych, uh, it was the entire regime that was set up in the post 91 settlement. And this is a question of income inequality. This is a question of the public-private blurring, how you use government power and state power to enrich yourself, uh, and how uh, income is redistributed upwardly um, in Eastern Europe. But also, this is a global conversation. Uh, we're having it right now ourselves. That's all I have to say. What I propose we do is we throw it to the audience, um, and so the audience will come and participate. Yes. Uh, I wanted to ask whether um, you find that um, um, what has happened in Ukraine, I wanted to pay attention to the social movements, to the protests of the citizens. So if you think that um, it has happened because of the environment, not only in Ukraine, but also in the in Europe, because of all this, for this movement, it, oh, I know that uh, the situation in Ukraine is very particular, but I wanted to hear your, your view about it's not just Europe, it's everywhere, it's Venezuela, so, um, and also you think that 21st century is the century of the civil society and these new forms of democracy. And then regarding more geostrategic, um, think about this Russia and this empire and influence, do you think that we can have more of these conflicts if other uh, Russia, uh, ex-Russia republics want to become friendly with the European Union, even it's not going to be as a membership, or because I mean you talk about the surprise, so I don't know whether it's done. So thank you. So um, in, sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in terms of your first part of the question of whether is there something kind of going on globally with what's happening. Is this Thing. So, uh, you know, I'm going to propose, and I can't tell you whether this is right or not, but this is my speculation, that um, we've entered an era where the way that people mobilize and can mobilize is changing. And it's precisely because of what we call Web 2.0 and the social media communication, and that we're entering a phase, as was said to promotion earlier here, of leaderless revolution and, and organization. Off, you don't need offline organization to get people onto the streets the way you used to. And that, I think, is going to have a set of profound effects on what Dan was saying about surprise. If you take, you know, we know the, there are going to be French strikes every so often, right? Because there are unions in place, and there's organization, and there are people who come out in the streets. If you take, if I would bet, if you went and looked at mainstream media reports and looked, searched for the words surprise and protest and larger than expected, that's going up in the last couple of years. And it's not limited to any one region of the world. Right? We saw it in the Middle East. We see it in South America. We saw it in Turkey. right? Beyond belief, we saw it in Spain. We saw it in Ukraine. So that's not to detract from any of the idiosyncrasies, as you were saying, about the spe specific situation. And I, and I actually wrote this during the color revolutions. I think Yanni is absolutely correct that there is an underlying level of resentment in societies at, of what we would, might call in political science abusive regimes. Or, or, and we wrote, I wrote a lot about this after the, in the aftermath of the color revolutions. Um, so I think there's underlying things going on here that are different from things that are going on in other places. <laughs> but we, speaking of communications. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do think that we're living in a world where it is much easier to get large numbers of people to come onto the streets 
because of the speed at which online networks can develop. Right? There's a one of the, so I'm a co-director of the NYU Social Media and Political Participation Lab, and a number of graduate okay. researchers would, are here. I will take your card later. Yeah, yeah. So we. So, I mean, one of the things that we're looking at that we've just talked about in the last day is doing a sort of case study of the Euromaidan, Euromaidan PR Twitter handle, which went from nothing to tens of thousands of supporters. We've been writing about Facebook pages that didn't exist months before this who had 50, 60,000 likes. And so what you can see is two things happening here. One is that there is a possibility to spread information and organization planning where none, no offline organizations exist at rates of speed we've never seen before. But the other thing is that we can share information about how popular these initiatives are among other citizens through things like followers on Twitter, through things like likes on Facebook. And moreover, when we find out about these things existing, we often find out them about them from people who are in networks that we've already self-selected into where we may already have a degree of trust, or where we've already taken a step to say, no, I want to be friends with this person. So when this person tells me that they like the Euromaidan Facebook page, that means something different, I think, qualitatively different, and there's lots of evidence from social psychology to suggest them to support this, than just reading about it in the newspaper or seeing it on the television. So I, I can talk for hours about this, so I'll leave it at that and let someone else take this. It was, it was a great question, by the way. The, the, the quick, the quick Rephrasing what you said as a statement is that it can't be a coincidence, right? All of these movements are possible. It cannot be a coincidence. Madrid, London, uh, Paris, Athens, Istanbul, um, uh, you name it, uh, Caracas. Caracas. Um, so, so the thing is, so Russian friends and colleagues whom I respect and love, right, will come and say, ah, but you know, this is Russia, right? I say, well, yeah. And I say, well, you know, and you know, because I'm not Russian myself, you know, the easy answer to me always is, ah, but you don't understand Russia, right? And so my, late, my latest answer to them is, yes, but you don't understand the globe. <laughs> I just have a follow up question, Josh. Um, people who are mobilized in this way, are they willing to go all the way? I mean, don't you still need a core of people who are going to die ultimately in some of these in some of these instances? I mean, you can't do it all by Twitter. Does it matter? It does. It, if all you do is stay on Twitter then no, it doesn't matter. But if you get 50,000, 100,000 people, 200,000 people into the MyDog, I mean, this is, I mean, the thing, this is always the thing about people, there's this the Mount, Malcolm Gladwell slacktivism story. I mean, that's fine that it, you know, these, these are different types of groups and different types of organization, and this is a subject for scholarly inquiry, and this is exactly what we're trying to study. But everyone kept saying, you know, all these crowds that came about in the social media era unexpectedly, they kind of came and then they fizzled. The Turks are still in power. The um, you know the we haven't seen any you know we haven't seen a huge amount of change in Spain. The same. Well, ask Yanukovych about this. I mean, we've now seen people in the social media age where we got now we don't know. I mean, there's one there's one figure I've seen in one survey which said when they asked people how they ended up on the Maidan, how they got there, forty percent of them said they got an invitation from a friend or a family member on Facebook. And they chose that as the reason why they came there. Now, there's still lots to be done. We know that social media was way more prevalent uh, in Turkey. But we also know, one of the things we know from the lab, is that the use of Facebook and Twitter picked up significantly at each of the three inflection points of the crises. So when you look at the amount of people tweeting in December, and then at the end of January, and then in February, it's going up, up, and up. The other thing we know is that people in Ukraine were signing up for Twitter as the crisis went on. And each time, there was a big incident. There was a spike in new Twitter accounts in Ukraine, purely among people who were tweeting about what was going on in the Euro Maidan. There does seem to be a sense, too, that, that a self-consciousness among, among people out there that they have to translate this from online to physical bodies, yeah. um, in the cold, for instance, in, in, in Moscow. Yeah. And I remember, I don't, when I was reading just the other day where someone talked about, I have to go out now and be a pixel. I think maybe, are you comfortable with the proposition that these are global issues you know, that can be understand at least partly in global terms? Well, I think uh, I do agree with what uh, Joshua said. I think I rather disagreed with some of his explanation uh, for Russia's behavior, uh, but here I do agree. Yeah. Well, I disagree with yeah. I'm just trying to say. I was trying to say. Thank you all for, for these talks. Um, I, I, I have a question that hopefully will appeal or 
to the uh, empiricist and the, uh, those of us in the more narrative end of, of things. Um, and I, what was the first blast of the past, so to speak, for me um, was um, the, the resurgence or of, of, of Chechnya in India after the like, so-called second Boston massacre. And, and to hear that um, articulated as in, the, in, in the news and, and, and in such kind of tragic Way right was um, started uh, a lot of thinking for me about um, uh, how easy this uh, the, um, the the nature of the, the uh, terrorists, so to speak, for lack of better words, um, would um, uh, mean terrorists was I should say mapped onto um, uh, the, the the figures involved in in, the, in those events. So the discourse of terror and war on terror, which has been largely cast as a, as a Middle Eastern phenomenon, can be shifted into this, um, a, into quote unquote Russia, former Soviet Union, in this area. So I wonder if you guys could talk a little bit more about the narrative that, in, uh, that could be at work with respect to these events in uh, Ukraine now and how, how this is going to potentially, I mean, you mentioned international effects and alliances and allegiances and stuff. I think that, yes, Venezuela being only one of many other uh, nations, so, so to speak, that are um, really ready to kind of pit, like, you know, take a stock in either a pro US posture or an anti US posture. And given that kind of the turn for, we hear Cold War now. I mean, that's in my Facebook, Cold War, Cold War, Cold War, right? So so if, if you guys can talk about some of this narrative um, as well as the kind of more international um, concerns that we should be attending to um, with respect to alliances and such. Well, just briefly, one of the things, only one of the things that, that Stephen Cohen has said that has incensed people so much is that, is that Obama should have gone to the Olympics and stood side by side with Putin. Why? Because that's the only way to stand firm against terrorism. So it's interesting how that that narrative can, you know, both sides can, can do what they want with it, really. Well, in fact, the context was the Russians were so helpful. Um, in Syria. In, well, in, this fact, in, in Boston, and had gave all these warnings before Boston, and did we thank them now? Right. Um, what, what that also does suggest is the problem of of um, keeping so many different issues and narratives in mind at the same time. And, uh, um, his Cohen's point is also that um, everybody in the West is so concerned with gay rights, so what about nuclear um, proliferation? Um, and at some point, it becomes hard to just, at some point, people are prioritizing, and he's not happy with the priorities. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to call one thing into account on that, which is that, again, this goes back to what Yanni said before about corruption and the sort of post-1991 environment. And I, I mean, I look, I don't know anything about what's going on in Venezuela, I hope to know shortly. But I really don't think what people are protesting there is because they really want a more pro-US orientation and a less pro-Russian orientation. I think it's, a, it's the same thing that we're talking about here. It's about regimes where small numbers of people have access to lots of power, and people feel like they're not, you know, they're not getting a fair shake from how they're being treated by the regimes. And I'm going to bet that's what it, is at the root of what's going on uh, in Venezuela, just like through it. And I think there's always, when I started writing about the color revolutions, it was actually because I wanted to get involved, because I thought US policymakers were making a big mistake by assuming that everything that was going on in the Orange Revolution was about this wanting to have this pro US, pro NATO event and this anti Russia event. And my writings on it were really about, no, 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 you got to think about the individuals and what the individuals are out here for and what's motivating them to take part the actual Ukrainian citizens and what is motivating them to sort of take part in these things. So I think we want to be careful about drawing those big, uh, those big uh, rush strokes. Onto, I don't think a ton of people, in, and just to caveat that with one thing, going back to Yanni's thing, when he said in the beginning of, of your remarks, when you talked about the beginning of this, um, you know, the sort of pro-West, you know, was there, was it painted that there was a sort of anti, in the Western media, an anti-Russian component? I mean, I, th I think personally what was happening is that this wasn't so much a pro-West, uh, pro-US, anti-Russia story in the beginning. What this was about was about the EU and certain sort of fundamental guarantees of 
basic civil rights and, you know, being part of Europe, which we saw this in Slovakia under Mechiar, you know, in the 1990s, about being part of Europe, not being excluded from Europe, versus the Russian model under Putin, which I think we have to distinguish between anti-Russianism and not wanting a particular oligarchic form of political rule that's called the managed democracy, that um, that the somehow, for whatever reason, this shutting down of this, this esoteric event, this not accepting a trade agreement, right, it brings them back to the first Star Wars movie, right, you know, is it, you know, that whenever no one could understand how Star Wars, how like you think about good and evil and the new reboot about a trade agreement, right? This is this is about a trade agreement, but I think it spoke to this sort of fundamental thing. So that's it's different from pro-U.S. anti-Russia. It, it's a, it, it, although it has a West versus East edge, I think it's different. I, I agree with you. It's the press reporting it as. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ideologically, I don't mean to paint these strokes, but but the concern being that those strokes will be painted possibly, or could they be painted possibly? Are they being painted possibly by way of media apparatus? I, you know, yeah. That was my there is one interesting thing to note: um, South Ossetia and Abkhazia are currently recognized by five countries, four of which are Venezuela, and Nicaragua, Tuvalu, and Vinatu. Uh, which are islands in the South Pacific somewhere, and I forget which one the third is, but it's the fifth one, is, but it's not in Eurasia. So, so I want to kind of bridge uh, the cultural and political discussion here. So what uh, Elliot said about the refighting of World War II, it definitely did not start with uh, this Crimea crisis, it started earlier. I will give two examples, for example, why uh, the only Russian independent TV channel was cut off from any cable or satellite broadcasting because they asked if, in a poll whether it was a good idea to uh, survive in the siege of Leningrad rather than to surrender it and save millions of lives and then refight it like Kiev or Odessa were liberated later. And uh, today the editor-in-chief of largest uh, Russian news website was fired because he had just a link, not a quotation, not an interview, just a web link. Uh, to an article, another website, uh, written by these far-right people uh, in Ukraine. So this star, who was that? Uh, Len oh, 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 yeah. 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 So uh, the problem, so uh, this, uh, uh, there are some proposals in Russian parliament about introducing a bill that would uh, punish as a crime uh, criticizing the Red Army and think about like, what Red Army did uh, before uh, 1941, when they coordinated with Nazis and all that. So this, uh, is like this is a cultural change, but maybe it points out to some political implications, namely the change of the coalition of selector that, that Putin is ruling about. So uh, this uh, change from like uh, some balance between people who are uh, ferociously patriotic and uh, trying to like rebuild this great Russia and people who are oriented to the global, people who are at least interested in getting money, maybe not liberals, but uh, ideology, but are interested in, in having business with the West. Maybe this is balance uh, is changing, and interestingly, one of the like uh, events that is symbolizing this change is uh, firing of the liberal uh, finance minister Alexei Kudrin several years ago. And remember why he was fired from? He was fired from because he thought that the proposed Russian military budget for the next 10 or 20 years is too large, it's several trillion rubles. Uh, over over this uh, period of time, so uh, they are ready for if their borders will be challenged. They are thinking not about good relationship with uh, UN or US or EU or whatever. They are uh, preparing uh, to have a strong military mm -hmm. for the petition. Um, Arthur, so uh, may I comment on uh, on what? Of course, Sergey. Sergey, sir. Uh, I'm often asked uh, uh, now which country uh, was better, or rather worse, Soviet Union or Putin's Russia? It's a very <laughs> popular question right now. And uh, I now say, well, that, that Putin's Russia is, is worse than, than the old Soviet Union, and then I start to explain it. And one of, uh, of my explanation is that, after all, Soviet Union was about the future. It was about building a new society. It was about building a new human being, человек будущего, you know, space program, and so on. 
Putin's Russia is only about the past. It's an absolutely uh, backwards country. And I can understand why. I mean, if, if there are no achievements uh, uh, today, and the future, of course, is even darker than that, you know, the only way you can get inspired is, is go to the past. Therefore, you know, all this history about the Great Patriotic War, and for the first time ever uh, this year, Russia will celebrate the 100th anniversary of World War II, and, it, and the heroism of Russian soldiers in that war, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's like, you know, back to Ivan the Terrible, you know, who was probably the, the best manager ever. And uh, uh, so I, I see absolutely nothing surprising in, in the fact uh, that, uh, you know, all this narrative, that, as you all would love to say, goes about about uh, you know the Nazism uh, you know the Panderovsky uh, the uh, Zapadniki of the 19th century and so on. I mean, it looks looks like you know the country is uh, is only partially uh, well or only physically exists in the 21st century. Mentally, it's 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 somewhere far back. I mean, you know. Uh, the 19th century, in, in the best case, most 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 probably before that. Yeah, but physically, it's still right under the Russia. Yeah, True. and also, and, and also, yeah. it's actually easier, I think, to mobilize people to kill each other in the name of the future. I mean, I think it, I think that's that's very problematic to be future oriented. You can yeah, you can um, you can give up a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, Elliot has to has, has to run off to the final words. So thank you, Elliot. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Uh, these are two different presenters who are supposed to be on the panel, but for some reason went there. So, uh, so uh, just a couple of quick points. So, hey, even if it be just a simple diversion, in the sense that the rush, the ruble exchange rate was going down for the last year. The, the forecast that the economy is going to be at zero rate this year has been there right last year. Okay, and. Uh, one of the most organized opposition to Putin and Russia is actually the right-wing opposition. That's one of the organized opposition right now, in addition to the Communist Party. Now, I don't imagine the right-wing opposition, organized opposition, actually protesting against the government which is at war. It's very difficult to imagine. So I'm not saying that's a cause, but that's a one possible sort of side benefit of waging this type of war. And the second thing I wanted to note is that uh, I was surprised that Diana was so surprised about the irredentism of Russia. I see your argument that by making this claim that borders can be reviewed, this sort of opens the cage for everybody to make that claim as well. But in the region, Russia is the only, the only entity that, that can actually make those claims credible, because they, they only, they, the only entity that has a gun. And so I, I don't see this being problematic for them at all. So the, 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 the Federation Council, uh, as far as I read this morning, was actually discussing how they should amend the Russian constitution and the law to be able to incorporate new entities in the, in the in the nation, because legally it's not so simple. You have, you have ended this business in the constitution, now you have to open up. So we actually are discussing the laws of how to do it. So I'm from, I'm from Lithuania, we have a couple of areas with a dense Russian population, and one of them we had yesterday on online petition uh, to sign up for the, for the local Russians, uh, like a referendum on their referendum to join the Russians, because of course it's, it has been legal power, etc. But you know these things are going on. There's, there's an ad flying around in the Leningrad Oblast about how Estonians are buying up the land in the Leningrad Oblast and they're going to use it as a sort of Trojan horse to, to invade and take away the land from Russia. So these are all some little jokes, but you know this is this is actually happening. So I don't I don't I don't find it, the the irredentism is so so surprising. I, I I find it surprising. The, the question is is it, uh, Sir is making the point that you know, from his perspective irredentism has been on the agenda for a while. Right? And it's not at all surprising. And, and I can see that perspective. I, I can see that. But I, I still don't agree with that. Um, if, I, if I look at a broad picture, there's just too much cost to thinking that way. And that the way I understood Russia flexing its international power was really economic power from their point of view. Back when necessary by the military. But then you've described any 21st century empire. The military is there, but really your power is hegemonic and right? economic. And I, and I think that this is largely how I understood the Russian government thinking until recently. Until recently. 
and sending troops into Crimea in order to push for a change of borders would be the sign of the failure of that hegemonic power, uh, of their economic power. But um, I, I still think that you know you used to be able to say, so you have Putin and you have the government, who keep a certain stability, don't say too much. If I say so little that we don't know what they're thinking, right? Um, but then you had, like the Duma, you had some, some local legislative institutions, and they could say whatever they wanted, you know, sort of like a Tea Party, you know, fine, I read Kima. But they're not speaking for Russia, right? Uh, now I'm not so sure about this, this, and so I am surprised. And at least I find this different. Uh, I also, yeah, I just want to add that, you know, all those nightmares of uh, Lithuanians, Estonians, even the Kazakhs, and so on, uh, they may come true. Uh, because uh, largely, l largely because of the reaction of the international community to what uh, Putin does, I think that generally there would be no uh, annexation of of, of of Crimea if uh, if some things uh, did not happen in the near past. I mean, one thing is uh, obviously Kosovo. You know, which kind of gave uh, gave uh, Putin a, a certain moral reason to, uh, you know, for the referendum and, and for you know uh, taking part of uh, of other countries' and territory. Another thing uh, was, of course, a very kind of muted reaction of uh, of of the Western countries, and particularly uh, Bush's. Uh, United States to what has happened in Georgia in, in, in 2008. And, and this has led, uh, you know, to the fact that which for me is quite obvious. I mean, uh, Putin is a mediocre person uh, who's, got, who's got now a menu of grandeur and who's really got this feeling that, you know, as we say in Russia, by Malboka Zaborodo. Uh, he's caught uh, God by his uh, uh, by his beard uh, with his hand. I mean, he now thinks you know that anything is possible because he understood uh, seeing what's happening in the West. He understood that in today's world, uh, who wins is not the one who is the strongest. Because apparently America is much stronger in every sense. I mean, ten times uh, stronger than Russia economically, financially, military, and so on. But the winner is not the one who is stronger, but the one who's the most brutal. Uh, you know, he may be small, but uh, but know some uh, uh, judo uh, uh, tricks. And I'm afraid that he firmly, he firmly believes in that. And of course, he has absolutely deep and profound contempt for for the rotten West, you know, who with all their armies and money and blah blah blah, you know, who can't really do anything to him. And 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 therefore, you know, given this this kind of uh, of psychology uh, multiplied by uh, a little bit of insanity and impunity, and uh, uh, you know, support of uh, of his uh, circle uh, followers in Russia. I mean, it, it, it can lead to totally unpredictable, unpredictable results, and there might be much more surprise than uh, than we've uh, we've had already. And 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 this would be a surprise which will, can easily lead to third world war. If, uh, if again, if uh, uh, the West, if the so-called civilized world, again will swallow what uh, uh, what Putin is doing. But aren't we all agreed that you know, the West is not going to be with the Ukraine? You said this for everybody in this room. That yeah, the Ukrainians are on their own when it comes to us. I mean, the United States put the troops in the head of Ukraine. The sanctions are purely symbolic. You know, so five generals can't travel to the U.S. Yeah. Well, I. I actually think that uh, the sanctions might be uh, more than symbolic. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely against sending troops and uh, you know and doing uh, ruthless things like that, or or bombing Russia, or or selling, uh, sending the sixth fleet uh, to the Crimea. But I think that economic sanctions 
and, and, and personalized sanctions against, uh, against those uh, who, who need to be blamed for, uh, for all, all of these mega hooligans happening, they must be implemented. And every Magnitsky list might, must start with one very well known name, Vladimir Putin. And, and and this will be and this will be something uh, this probably will be the only thing that will teach him how to behave. Yes. I mean to me a lot of this discussion is, is about in search of a catalyst, right? For this whole thing. You've acknowledged that the offer from the EEC was small beer. And if in fact that's the case, and, and uh, my so excuse my pronunciation, um, was offering an election in another six months. So to me, the people should have stand down and gone through the process of a, of a free election. The fact that they didn't means there was catalyst. And what's the catalyst? And we all know that Putin refused to turn over uh, Syria for a pipeline from Saudi Arabia and Qatar all the way to Europe because that would have cut substantively his revenue position relative to his own transmission of gas. And so and counter that, Action begets reaction. They made a decision for Newland, Victoria Newland, to spend $5 billion and have her set the game up with her chosen successors, which she's already announced on the video. And um, that game was put in motion by a small cadre of parties that were capable of taking the $5 billion and turning it into a bullet that uh, is common for uh, 72 people. Um, so a um, small number of people can create a vast ripple. And obviously, uh, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, all enables those things. But you have to look sometimes at who wins. So the ultimate win, is it moving the NATO line? Is, is that what the US objective is? Um, or is it the substantive natural gas deposits that have been discovered by Shell and by Chevron uh, in the east, uh, which are very, very substantive from what I understand, um, as uh, a, a means of, of uh, uh, thwarting uh, the transmission from, uh, uh, this, uh, from Russia. And what Putin is really doing is not offensive, but defensive. And it's defensive with respect to the first move, which is protecting uh, the warm water port, which he should do at absolutely any cost, because in fact it's that. And it's not about people, it's about that. And he's got those people who happen to be Russian, all of which someone made a decision a long time ago to move the, uh, uh, the other ethnic group out, out uh, to the east. And so, um, Without the United States setting this up as a catalyst and moving the line from their agreement associated with the unification of Germany and keeping the NATO line roughly at that line, at that area, and the steps of Russia, um, they basically trampled over, moved the NATO line. Those people lost 20, 30, 40 million people, paid dearly for it. They wanted the steps there to protect themselves. And the United States made the decision, we're going to tweak that. Now, whether the tweaking is just to move the NATO line or they eventually want the 6 million square miles uh, of, of Russian land for privatization and an LBO, um, I, I, I don't know. That, that may take another 50 or 100 years. Um, but why aren't you entering into a catalyst going external to internal? as opposed to all this, uh, I would call, sweetness and light. Um, you might, yeah? Go ahead. Well, I mean, yeah, there, there's a lot of, I, mean, my, I don't disagree with myself with anything you've said. It's just that I, I don't have the same certainty that you have. And Excuse the, me? I don't have the same certainty. And one of the reasons why I don't have the certainty is because I can't tell anymore who's deciding what. Right. And why? But isn't that part of the reason why they do it the way they did? I mean, you can go online and read Confessions of an Economic Hitman, right? Yes. We both can. Yes. And many people in this room may know that story. Yes. And that is not one-off. That's not a two-off. They did it 
over and over and over again. The guy who came up with the idea was actually Ukrainian in Louisiana, in New Orleans, um, who went after Guatemala uh, for the bananas. Yeah. And, and from there, United Fruit took that game with the Dulles Brothers, and they perfected the game, and now they move it around the world. The one part of what you're saying, which I think is actually really interesting, is why we care so much, for instance, about human rights in Russia, but say very little about most of the rest of the world, right? Um, for instance, China. You know, so if you want to talk about intellectual regimes, you want to talk about corruption, you know, where political power gives you a human power, just you know, look at China, but we don't have that conversation. I think one of the reasons is... Talk about the, human rights yeah. again. If no one really cares about it. It may or may not be. Some people take it seriously. <laughs> right? But, but the, what I'm saying is that the United States really has very little investment in Russia. Very little investment. It's genetically small. Yes. Uh, which means that it's sort of a non-issue. So? Where it does become an issue is you've heard talking about, okay, it's not so much what do you gain by acting, but what do you lose by acting. So in the case of Russia, or in Ukraine, if you were to act on this Ukraine and the Ukrainian issue, then you do lose very immediately what you need for natural gas for Western Europe. So you could bring in the tankers which you not natural gas for your uh, No. Cracking. So liquefy is $6 a thousand. That's right. So that's what I'm saying. So it's $12 versus $8. And it's a huge difference for a large economy. This is true. This is true. Yes? So speaking of uncertainty, something I've been uncertain about for a while is the, the degree to which the, what I call the, the re-Sovietization of a lot of the political discourse in Russia is affected. So, for example, there's a poster out now. I know it's on Tiff Sky. It might be all over the Moscow. It might be all over the country with a map of Ukraine and a man's a man's face, kind of going like this. And you have these U.S. troops that are dressed like uh, like World War II soldiers approaching, and it's like Norwich. And I, I just I wonder so much with um, with this ideology and constant re constant references to fascists and fascism, which is of course quite a trigger term to this day in Russia, what, um, what in your opinion, and how effective is this? It's not a question I can answer. I think it's a really good question. I mean, is there empirical research? I mean, I don't have access. I don't have access to survey data. I mean, we could try to look in the social media data to see how much the rhetoric is being heated. Right. Is one thing which we haven't done, but that's a that's a great thing that you can kind of do. We know what a lot of people are saying. We absolutely know there are there were anti-Maidan website uh, Facebook pages that went up in Russia during the Kakte um, on Facebook during the Maidan protests that were pretty vitriolic. I mean, when we looked at them, there was sort of that. I mean. I do know, I mean, there's a simpler explanation, right, for the rise in popularity of Putin right now in Russia, which is what we call this sort of rally around the flag effect, which goes back to what Arturis was talking about before, about the, you know, the potential of this big diversionary and time where Putin's popularity is going lower. That wouldn't necessarily, I think the fact that you've seen Putin's popularity go up right now, I don't think is, is at all, to say today that we don't know the answer to this question, is it all an answer to whether this rhetoric is catching on, whether it's affecting people's opinion, that I can just say as a political scientist is a perfectly natural response that we see in many cases when countries get into uh, foreign entanglements to try to go beyond beyond. Bush's approval was at 91% after 9-11. That didn't last, you know, indefinitely. Um, I mean, I do think among my generation, you know, who grew up at you know, grew up at the end of the, the post-Soviet, the end of the Soviet period. Uh, certainly in Eastern Europe, there's a lot of resistance, you know, to the language of this, and there's a lot of sort of um, this kind of dualism of saying one thing and completely thinking completely the other. How much that persists today in Russia? How much going back to what Anne said about the consequences of oh, this is what we were talking before about the consequences of what happened in the 1990s for retroactively uh, improving people's uh, faith in what happened under Soviet times, and the extent to which that makes it people more receptive to messages that were being uh, that were being given in Soviet times and how they might resonate today, I think it's a wonderful, uh, is a very, very important question. But I don't think we have the data to answer that. And just as an anecdote, one of my graduate students is Russian, uh, did me the favor of forwarding to me the uh, not job emails that she was getting from her Russian nationalist relatives. But you know, the way that I persuaded her to do so was because she was embarrassed by them, um, was by first forwarding to her the emails that I get from my not job relatives. Right? Obama is a Muslim, he's a Saudi plant, things like that. So uh, you know, the significance of, of these images 
and the way they're circulating, I don't think, you know, we can look at the images and be appalled or shocked. I don't think we can know much about their real perception without without research. My, my, my first asking would be with the vast majority of the population doesn't know and care, <laughs> actually. Um, Yes, uh, thank you so much for your first hand account of what you promised uh, in uh, my time. I really appreciate that. So much time. Uh, I waste so much time trying to figure out what really went on, and I needed that. Thank you. Your first hand account of what went down, what you witnessed. When uh, Finland took out uh, Russia in Sochi in the uh, semifinals, I said, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard what you all, uh, who has spent so much time trying to understand the uh, forces at work here, I decide, I think now that you ought to add that perhaps as your sixth motive there, possible motive, a way of looking at what's going on. 1968, checks <laughs> one. 56 the water but seriously, my question is, um, I had some confusion between your third and fifth motives there. The impure, if I have them right, the empirical uh, reinstatement motive and the business expansion motive. Um, I mean, it's well taken. I just think it's a separate, I mean, those two can be intimately connected. And I think you're absolutely right. So I, 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 I've just been trying in my own mind to sort out different arguments that I'm seeing that people are putting out there. But I think it's a good point, and there's no reason to think that one of those is not uh, related <coughs> to the other. I would say the um, the one thing I would say about the one point of sort of subtlety that I might try to draw there is that one of the so one of the things people are talking about is that the greater Russia nationalist nationalism movement, you know, to restore the Soviet Union, this is being couched in a way of being done at the expense of economic interests, right? That there are all these, you know, liberal economists who can say, why this is such a terrible mistake, all these things going on, but this drive to restore Russia's greatness, you know, su supersedes that. The fifth argument is more saying, actually, if you want to understand what's going on on the ground in Ukraine right now, look to who has the economic interests uh, that are threatened, look at who have the economic interest that might be uh, helped by this situation. So that, that's the sort of, one would almost say that, that they're willing to pursue this greater Russia at the expense of economic benefits. The other one would say, no, the greater Russia is a convenient cover for what are some potential economic benefits. But you're right, the two, the two are. Yes. Uh, yeah. What you should said. Well, if we touched upon you know, those, those explanations, that is, uh, I just want to add in what I disagree. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's uh, the, the first of all, explanation number one, the interests of Russian population. Completely fake. I mean, in the Crimea, Russians are a majority, <coughs> live very nicely. There's absolutely, everyone uh, speaks Russian language there, so, so they've never been oppressed by, by the Ukrainian minority, who is about 13% or 15% percent population of, of Crimea. Yeah, the main uh, argument is, uh, is, uh, is not that, it's the fact that there are other former Soviet republics where Russian population really suffers, and, and this is uh, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, where from uh, a lot of Russians have been expelled, many of them have been jailed, uh, and they really live there as uh, second grade citizens. And, and Putin has never uh, raised this issue during his talks with um, Turkmenistan or, 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 or Islam Irinov and so on. Even in Kazakhstan, there have been a lot of complaints about, you know, from the side of the Russian population. And this, and this has always been muted by, uh, by Russian authorities. So they, you know, they couldn't care less about Russia. Population, they 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 just use this as as an argument, you know, if, uh, when they want uh, you know to go further. Uh, it's not going to be your opinion. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, I'm yeah. trying to get the universe of explanation. Uh, so I really don't know about the Baltic Sea Fleet. Could be important, uh, but I don't think that it's it's gravely important. Well, I really think that the two main explanations is one is the. Uh, it's, it's the purely imperialist uh, 
motivations, uh, you know, and 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 uh, a will to restore the Soviet Empire. And, and uh, I don't know why this would be important, especially at, at such a price. But I think that uh, uh, that is uh, motivation really exists, no matter how sick it is. Uh, but the main the motivation is the revenge for Maidan, you know, because Ukraine has really displayed a, 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 a very convincing alternative to uh, to Russia and to Putin's rule, and uh, I think I think that this was something that that really that really infuriated Putin, both politically but also personally. I mean, when he saw people. Uh, uh, taking photos at uh, Yanukovych's uh, residence in Mishiguri, and I'm quite sure that he thought, okay, so uh, this may happen to me, you know, and they will also discover, you know, a, a bread loaf made of pure gold. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take two more questions, one from there, one from there. We have both of them at the same time, and then we'll um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Our comments to yeah. Thank you. Um, my question is really about kind of the future and rehabilitation. I spent the first six months of last year in Tunisia, and I spent uh, the first fri Thursday, Friday, and Saturday of December in Kiev, probably about a week before you were there. Right? Um, the, the issue is social media. Uh, clearly a unique potential to mobilize, to interest, to capture. But I would submit that its ability to become an instrument for genuine monitoring towards good governance in any of these countries that we've named is a radically different proposition. My question is for the panelists, what, what factors do you see in Ukraine? What would you look for? that would lead us to say in two years time, for example, that in fact Ukraine is a good news, a good, um, a good story, a good news story, a, a hopeful story. What would you be looking for in coming, say, six months or so, uh, building on Maidan, for example, and your, your hopeful account of what went on there when you were there in, uh, in December? Thank you. Actually, this is great. Our questions go together really nicely. So. Um, I, you know, I've been watching all this kind of unfold on social media, and that's sort of a weird perspective to have. And I think that all this conversation about narratives has been really interesting. And um, I think one of the most interesting things for me has been how the the media internationally has latched onto these narratives and then used them in their discussions of policy as if these narratives created by the sorts of like billboards and propaganda and, and these sorts of official positions on both sides are reality, you know? And it was funny because John Stewart actually did a piece on this last night. But I mean, you see this where the international community is latching onto these narratives. And so what I'm interested in is from your perspective, kind of going beyond those narratives, where, where are we going? Right? Not, I, I think we've got a really fascinating and wonderful discussion of where we've been, and I know you all are really excited to predict given how surprising this has all been. But what are the next steps, right? So if you're if you're thinking about policy and what, what the government in Kiev should do and how or or what where we're sort of headed with this, I'd like to know what you see happening sort of <coughs> underneath um, I guess the what what's sort of happening broadly in the international media. Okay, well, I think I think it was only to, today that they see now I may, uh, finally came up uh, with uh, with very kind of extended comment on uh, what's happening and what will happen uh, uh, at uh, this Crimean crisis. And I think that I, I do tend to agree with his prediction. He says that uh, most probably Putin will use his, uh, as he puts it, two, step, uh, two steps forward, one step back tactics. So after the referendum, which apparently will give like 80%, uh, you know, let's, let's go to Russia right now and have our wages quadrupled, as, as, as it has been already promised. And by the way, now I also says 
uh, very witty. You know, if uh, if Russia uh, has offered the United States of America that each citizen will have their <laughs> their in income uh, multiplied by four, then uh, then he thinks that the United States would also like to join Russia. <laughs> uh, so uh, it says that. Uh, after this referendum, uh, most probably uh, Putin will say something like, well, we are very glad that the people of, uh, of, of Crimea want to join us. That's, that's good news. That's fantastic. But of course, it's a very complicated process. So, so what, uh, what we hear in Russia suggest is that uh, you know, we don't accept the Crimea right away. There must be you know, a period of transition or something. And uh, therefore, Crimea will turn into this kind of weird, uh, non-recognized states like uh, Pridnestrovia, uh, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Karabakh, and so on. I mean, you know, a country which is not recognized by everyone, of course, uh, uh, that is manipulated by uh, by the big neighbor. But uh, he thinks that. Uh, uh, that what will follow will be more or less like that. Well, uh, the the consequence of the Crimean crisis, which actually uh, the strongest and the most dramatic to me personally, is that indeed there will be much more of how to call it. Uh, Turn it down. Uh, Screwing of the bolts or tightening the screws, right? Lots of familiar with English idioms and sometimes may sound a bit uh, obscene. Sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I'm flying back. Uh, Back to my motherland on, on on Thursday, March the 20th, and I really have no idea what of, uh, of what will happen to me there. And uh, you know, judging by by what I read, and every day brings more and more awful news. I mean, you know, it looks like like a nut house. Uh, so, uh, uh, but but it will definitely it would definitely get worse because. It, because right now, given the level of support uh, in this chauvinistic uh, kind of party that is happening uh, in my poor country now, uh, I think that, uh, that Putin feels that his hands are untied, and and and, and uh, well, of course, you know, he still cannot do everything he wants outside of Russia, although he may try. Uh, but in inside of Russia, I think that uh, that will have a full time. A revival, not of uh, the Soviet regime as I know it, you know, this senile Brezhnev type uh, kind of uh, funny, funny, highly developed socialism, but we'll have a full, full scale uh, comeback of Stalinism. And, 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 and this, I think, is the worst news for Russia, much worse than it. Economic sanctions uh, and whatever. I think that, uh, from the point of view of of uh, kind of Russians' fate, you know, in the context of global civilization, I think this is absolutely catastrophic. Because, well, uh, you know, there is the popular theory that in the 21st century there will be no concept of developing countries. There will be highly developed countries and underdeveloped countries, and nothing in between. Uh, some of the developing countries, like say China, India, South Korea, they've made uh, you know a jump into in, uh, into the into the higher league. Other countries, of course, you know, will stay underdeveloped forever. Russia, uh, by far, was like in limbo in between the two. I mean, it, it, uh, it used to be a highly developed country when it was Soviet Union. It was developed technologically, more or less uh, well, funny, but uh, it's not quite mighty uh, economically and, and military. Uh, but uh, of course, the science and education uh, used to be on a really, really high level. Uh, 
uh, and this I think is is probably the main uh, indication of, of whether the country is developed or not. Uh, and and after that, you know, the economic sanctions, the isolation, and, and so on, Russia will die deeply in, and and I'm afraid forever in, in into this uh, never developed uh, like fourth world uh, swamp. And 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 I think it's uh, this is absolutely tragic, it's, uh, you know, especially if you think about it. This is Russia, you know, a country with incredible history, fantastic culture, you know, lots of, lots of, all kinds of donations to human civilization that we will become North Korea with 11 time zones. And, and you know, I, I, I just can't imagine it because it's, it's so bad that it's, it's, it, it's really impossible to imagine. I think we should close on that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you.